Hello, welcome back to our series, Sermon on the Mount. We're in episode 24. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 6, verses, or verse 24, which I have highlighted over here. And we talked about a little last time where Jesus said here, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon, of course, means money and material things or riches, anything that is material. And leading on from this, he says in verse 25, he says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. So therefore, take, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. So there is a connection between the two verses. Because verse 25 begins with these words where he says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, or don't be anxious. Or in other words, for this reason, do not be anxious. Now we know that anxiety is something that is common to almost all human beings. And the sad thing is it is found in almost uh, or among almost all believers. And yet I want you to notice here that at least three times in these ten verses the Lord says do not be anxious or do not take care for certain things. First of all in verse 25 which we just looked at. And then again he says it in verse 31 where he says take no thought what you sh uh, saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed uh, and then he says it again in verse 34 down here therefore take no thought for the morrow for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof so why are people anxious would be the question that should come to mind Anxiety comes, and notice this connection in verse 25, for this reason, or uh, therefore I say unto you. So the reason is because people are serving mammon. Their eye is clear, which we know is the conscience. And we go back to verse 22 and 23, which are up here. Where it says, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? So their eye is not clear. And we can go back to verses 19 through 21. And that shows that their treasure is on earth. If your treasure is in your child, you will be anxious concerning your child. If your treasure is in money, you will be anxious concerning money. If your treasure is in your physical health, you will be anxious concerning your physical health. Anxiety is related to our heart and our treasure being something here on earth. Jesus has come to save us. And we have considered how Jesus has come to save us from self-centeredness when we studied verses 19 through 13 in what's commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. And here we see that Jesus has also come to save us from the love of money. And speaking of the love of money, I pulled out the story here in Luke 19 of Zacchaeus who was a publican or a tax collector. And when Jesus came to Zacchaeus' house, he said that salvation has come to this house, which is down here in Luke 19, verse 9. And what was Zacchaeus saved from? He was saved from the love of money. He was willing to make restitution. We see that in verse 8, when the Lord said that he would come and be a guest at his house for dinner. And... Look at Zacchaeus' response, just being in the presence of the Lord, being you know the Lord being a righteous man, 
Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. So Zacchaeus has this repentant heart and is willing to make restitution. And, but we see on the other hand another story in the previous chapter in Luke chapter 18 of the rich young ruler. So this rich young ruler is inquiring about you know, what must I, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus goes through many of the commandments here in the beginning. And he says, I've kept them all from my youth up. And then when Jesus says, well, yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And when he had heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So we see this rich young ruler's love of money was the one thing he lacked. And he went away sad because he wanted treasure on earth. And how many others have followed after the rich young ruler? Zacchaeus was rich too. And in Zacchaeus, whom we read of in Luke 19, which we just saw, and the rich young ruler, described in Luke 18, we have a contrast. The reaction of rich people when they come to Jesus. You either go the way of Zacchaeus or the way of that rich young ruler. Depending on which is your master, Jesus made it very clear to both of them that we were not to have two masters. Zacchaeus gave up serving money and began to follow Jesus. And that is how we can be free from anxiety too. So we need to be very clear in this area as to what it means to serve mammon. What was Jesus' attitude in regards to money? And we read in John's Gospel, chapter 13, especially in verse 29, this is the Last Supper when uh, Judas is about to go out and betray, uh, betray the Lord. He's given the sop by the Lord. And then it says, After the sop, Satan entered into him, and then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest do quickly. So John 13, 28, Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. In verse 29, For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, Buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. And he then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. So they, the disciples thought, when Jesus told Judas to do what he must do, to, that he was going to go buy those things that they have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the, to the poor. So these two motivations. And how did the disciples get this impression? Because they knew that Jesus spent his money mostly for those two things, to buy what was there was need of and to give to the poor. And notice the two things, buy what you have need of and give to the poor. This is how Jesus spent his money. And when a person is interested in spending his money and buying what is needed and giving to those who are needy, his attitude to money is right. He's laying up his treasure in heaven. We don't need to give all our money and live like beggars or go off to the mountain, we can buy what we need. Jesus himself did that. But what is extra, we need to help those who are in need, not just think of accumulating more and more for ourselves. Many people get into a lot of problems, not only in relation to anxiety, but they get into many, many other trials because they have never been delivered from the love of mammon. Paul, writing in 1 Timothy Chapter 6, and most specifically in verse 10. In verse 10 he says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So some longing for it, uh, and that doesn't mean by receiving it unexpectedly. Some people receive a lot of money in their lives unexpectedly. But by, for long, but by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierce, them through, pierce themselves with many a pain or with many sorrows. And many people 
who want to get rich in first Timothy six nine it says but they that that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition so these two verses are very severe in warning that we reap what we sow and for this reason the Lord says in Matthew 6:25 over here I say to you don't be anxious or take no thought for your life so first of all settle whom you want to live for do you want to live for money or do you want to live for God particularly if you are in Christian work it is very very important to remember that you cannot be a servant of God unless you are freed from serving money you must not preach for money you must not heal the sick for money you must not pray for money you must not do anything for the Lord with an eye on the gift that you will receive from that person or from those people to whom you have preached. In that case, you are a servant of money and not a servant of God. And there are lots of people wandering around the world today calling themselves servants of God who are actually servants of money. Their interests are not uh, God in the spiritual development of others. Their interest is in the gift that they receive. And so that is a very searching verse. You cannot serve God and mammon. And when, anxiety, and when anxiety, anxiety comes, it is an indication that our treasure is on earth somewhere. So transfer your treasure to heaven, and you will be free from anxiety. That is the solution to anxiety. Transfer all of your treasures to heaven. If you have got a beloved child, give him up to God. If you have got some beloved possession, hand it over to God. Let him do what he likes with it. Let him get some thief to steal it if he wants, if that's God's will, if it becomes an idol in your life. Let him allow us to be broken down and this love of money be rooted out or love of mammon. And if we transfer our interests away from earth to heaven, then we cannot be anxious. He says, do not be anxious for your life what you shall eat and what you shall drink or your body as to what you shall put on so food clothing etc isn't your life more than food and the body more than clothing isn't your growing like Christ that's the only life worth calling a life isn't that more important than food which is more important to get more humility or to get richer food or better tasting food it's a question of value most people would be more interested in richer better tasting food than more humility in their life transformation of character to the likeness of Christ isn't that life more than food sure that's the whole point of our Christian walk isn't the body more important than clothing God will give you enough health to do his will why are you bothered about clothing? Clothing is so much for honor. So many people are worried about clothing. It's not that we don't have enough, but people want fancy clothes. And what do they wear fancy clothes for? And designer suits. It's not to glorify God, but to impress others. Be careful that your interests are in keeping your body fit and free from bad habits for the glory of God and partaking more and more of the divine life. That life and the body are more important than food and clothing, Jesus said. Don't be particular about food and clothing. Food that is simple and clothing that is simple is the best. The important thing is the life of Jesus and a body that is kept free from bad habits, free from impurities for the glory of God. So in Matthew 6.26, we see Jesus says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? So Jesus said we could learn from the birds that they are not anxious. We never find an anxious bird. Have you heard the story of the two birds that were talking to one another? And one bird asked the other, 
Why are these human beings so full of anxiety and worried all the time? And the other bird said, That must be because they don't have a heavenly father like we have who provides for us. And that is a shameful, shameful thing that we need to hang our heads in sorrow about. That though we say we have a heavenly father who is almighty and cares for us, but we can be anxious about earthly things. And Jesus said, Take no thought for your life, or be anxious. By being anxious, can you increase your height or length of life? Or which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? No. Why then are you anxious about food or clothing? Look at the clothing that God gives to the flowers of the field. They don't toil, they don't spin, and yet they are more beautiful than even Solomon in all his glory. So why do you take thought for your raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So why is faith so little in many believers? Because their treasure is on earth. If we would only transfer our treasure to heaven, we would easily have more faith, and we would be very much more free from anxiety. Do not be anxious, then, concerning what we should eat or drink, or what we shall be clothed with. These are the things the Gentiles seek after eagerly. If you want to be anxious about something, Jesus says in verse 33, Jesus says, be anxious about seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness first. So let's take a, just a few quick steps backward, backwards and, and sum up some of the things we've been learning. You know, we're talking here about not being anxious, that the disciples of Jesus aren't anxious. And we were considering in previous studies the wrong attitudes that the disciples of Jesus Christ can have. We considered a number of them. First of all, anger, verses 21 to 26 of Matthew 5. Sexual lust, Matthew 5, 27 through 32. Lying, Matthew 5, 33 to 37. Vengeance, Matthew 5, 38 to 42. Selectiveness in love, Matthew 5, 43 to 48. And seeking man's honor, Matthew 6, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. The love of money, Matthew 6, verses 19 through 24. And now anxiety, Matthew 6, 25 through 34. So anxiety is the eighth wrong attitude that Jesus warned his disciples against, and it's linked to the seventh one. It's when we love money or something of the earth when anxiety comes. And God desires that we love him with all of our hearts. And when we love God with all of our heart, any love for human beings or anything earthly is through God, and then there is no anxiety. And Jesus spoke here about our Heavenly Father. He says, Your Heavenly Father, verse 26, he feeds the birds or the fowls of the air. It's when we find our security in God as a father who will never forsake us or leave us or let us alone without food, clothing, or things necessary for us as though we were orphans. When we find our security in him as our heavenly father, that we can be this is when we can be free from anxiety. That's why Jesus spoke about the birds and says, Your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than they? And in another passage, Jesus spoke how we were worth more than the sparrows, and how not one sparrow would fall to the ground without your heavenly Father knowing about it. How much more you? And he uses this expression in verse 30, O ye of little faith. God who clothes the flowers of the fields will also clothe you, O ye of little faith. Notice that he says there it's due to lack of faith that anxiety comes. And we know the word of God says in Romans 117 right here that the just or the righteous shall live by faith. So faith is a word that is very rarely used in the Old Testament. It's a New Testament word, and people in the Old Testament also live by faith, as we can see 
uh, from Hebrews chapter 11, which is a summary of many of the Old Testament uh, people who lived by faith, beginning with Abel and going all the way through uh, many of the prophets, considering um, Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Moses and many others in the Old Testament. So, yet the word faith in the Old Testament, this word faith itself, is very rarely found in the Old Testament. So it's a New Testament word, pecul peculiar to the New Testament. And we learn that Jesus is the author and finisher of this New Testament faith. And this New Testament faith is seen in the life of Jesus, who is the, the author and finisher himself, as we read in Hebrews 12.1, which I have highlighted down here, or 12.2, uh, where we're to let, lay a, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. We're compassed about with all the so great a cloud of witnesses discussed in Hebrews 11. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us in Hebrews 12.2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And we know that he lived without anxiety because he was secure in his heavenly Father. And it is that same security that God wants us to have, a security in our heavenly Father. That's why, after a second time, in verse 31, where he says, Don't be anxious. Saying what, saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink. He's talking about the basic necessities of life. What shall we clothe ourselves with? And that includes housing and shelter as well. Food, clothing, and shelter. The three things people are most worried about. He says, all these things the heathen eagerly seek. And here is one mark of a heathen person or a non-believer that he eagerly seeks after food, clothing, and shelter. So, my friend, are you a heathen? You can become a heathen by e eagerly seeking after food, clothing, and shelter, and that's the mark of a heathen. Jesus said all these things the heathen eagerly seek. But what about you? Your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Do you think your Heavenly Father knows that you need food, clothing, and shelter? He knows that and He will provide it. You don't have to be afraid. Your Heavenly Father will provide it. But make sure that you live by faith, that you find your security in Him. And as a cure for anxiety, here is a very good prescription. It says in verse 33, which I'll show down here, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So if you sincerely obey seeking God's kingdom first, this command that you seek and continue to seek God's kingdom and righteousness first, I can assure you on the authority of God's word, you will be free from anxiety. When you are anxious, you are testifying that your primary desire in life is, that is not God's kingdom and his righteousness, but something earthly. That's why you are anxious about it. But here Jesus said that if you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things, and that is food, clothing, and shelter, shall be added to you. So think of that. The best way to live in the world where cost of living is going up, where the rate of inflation is going up, where the value of your money or dollar is going down, is to seek God's kingdom first, to seek his righteousness all these things will be added to you if you sincerely put God first and say, Hallowed be your name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done first, Lord, and that your whole life is set on seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness. That means to be absolutely righteous in every area, and you strive for it. That's the number one priority in your life. Then you need be anxious for nothing. A third time he says in verse 34, down here, Take no thought for tomorrow or for the morrow or what will happen tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble, trouble of its own, or sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. 
So Jesus said that each day God allows a certain amount of trouble and difficulty and trial to come our way. And that's very clear here in verse 34. Each day has enough trouble of its own, but the purpose of all that is that we might be sanctified. Why does God allow us to have some trouble each day? You might ask, so that we can be sanctified through that trouble. Not, not be anxious. Not to be worried about tomorrow's trouble. Everything that God sends our way is measured. And God will never allow us to be tested beyond our ability. And we know that from the scripture in 1 Corinthians 10.13, which is listed over here. Therefore, hath no temptation or testing taken you, but as such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you. Your Heavenly Father is faithful, who will not suffer or permit you to be tempted above, above that ye are able. He knows our frame. But will with the temptation or the testing also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. So you can bear up under it. In other words, he's in... in he will never allow us to be tested beyond our ability. And if he sends trouble for one day, he'll give grace for that day too. He's going to give us the grace to come through the trouble that's in our day. And here is a very clear command that we are not to worry about tomorrow, let alone next week or next month or next year. Now notice carefully, he's not saying we should not plan for next year. There may be things that you have to plan for next month or next year, but the command here is don't be anxious. The Word of God is not unrealistic. We cannot live in a world without planning for tomorrow or next week, but we don't have to be anxious. Make your plans maybe for two or three years if the Lord tarries, but don't be anxious for even one single day. And notice, notice this command in Philippians 4, chapter 6. It's a very clear command which says exactly the words of Jesus. It's repeated by Paul by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit where he says, Be careful for nothing or be anxious for nothing. And nothing means nothing. There is absolutely nothing that I should be anxious about. Then how should I handle these difficulties and trials that come to me each day? And here he gives us the solution. He says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication. So in other words, when this trouble for each day that has been allotted to us during the day comes, and some of it is tending to make me anxious, intending me to have some thought about tomorrow or next week, or about my children, or about my family, or something about my health is making me anxious, what should I do? Immediately. By prayer, and prayer means a general request for God's help. So let your request be made known unto God. Or, But in everything by prayer and supplication here. So the prayer is this general re request for God's help. And supplication, what does that word mean? Supplication means specific request, specifying exactly what the need is. And how are we to do that? With thanksgiving. This is the most important part. Thanksgiving is the expression of faith. When we believe that God has heard us, we thank Him. It's like writing something on a file and sending it up to our Heavenly Father. And we are sure that He has uploaded this or received the file. And He's going to take care of that thereafter. So let your, requ your requests be made known to God. And if you fulfill this condition, that is the matter that's bothering you, pray about it and specifically mention it to God and thank Him that He has heard it and that He is going to handle it. Then the peace of God, down here, that this is the opposite of human anxiety, the peace of God, not a human peace, the peace of God which can, you cannot understand or which passeth all understanding, will guard your heart and mind or keep it or guard it, in Christ Jesus, your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So the word guard or keep is a military word. It would be like an army of soldiers, a garrison of soldiers around your heart and mind, protecting you from the onslaughts of anxiety that the enemy flings at you.
But make sure, like Jesus says in verse 33, that your interest is God's kingdom. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Dear friend, here is the answer to this anxiety-ridden world in which we live. Set your affections on things above. Seek his kingdom and his righteousness. This does not mean be a full-time worker. It means in your secular work, like the king, let the kingdom of God and his righteousness be your first concern. And you will never need to be anxious about food, clothing, shelter, or your family or anything. You can live without anxiety day after day for the glory of God. Well, my friends, thank you for holding on to this message and listening. It's a little bit longer than, than others, but we sure are learning a, a, a lot through the Lord Jesus Christ. So thank you, and we'll see you next time.